So we were talking about uh, different types of extremophiles, organisms adapted to develop their whole life cycle at particular uh, physical and chemical conditions. And we started by talking about hypothermophiles and we had stopped here at the type of molecular adaptations that these organisms have to live and cope with very high temperatures. And um, here I'm, um, hypothermophiles, and I was mentioning that before, had, have attracted in particular uh, the attention and, uh, of, of different scientists because uh, there are some models on the origin of life that propose that perhaps life evolved at high temperature and also because at some point uh, scientists when observing the distribution of, uh, of hypothermophilic organisms in early trees of life uh, built on molecular markers, uh, in particular ribosomal RNA genes uh, from a variety of species, realized that organisms that were placed at the base of these branches, in particular in the case of archaea and the case of bacteria, and these uh, branches labeled with in red here correspond to uh, hypothermophilic organisms well, I, as I was saying, these uh, researchers found out that these organisms tended to be placed at the bottom of their respective domains, the archaea and the bacteria. In, in bacteria, we know two different groups of organisms that can live at higher te and temperatures higher than 80 degrees. And so consequently, uh, it was very easy to uh, hypothesize that the last common ancestor of this, uh, of both bacteria and archaea were, had been hypothermophiles and perhaps even the last uh, common universal ancestor or an ancestor. And so here you have pictures of these uh, different hypothermophilic organisms within the bacteria and within the archaea. However, this question on the, uh, uh, the nature of the thermophilic adaptation of the last common ancestor has been a matter of debate. And because uh, when people started to explore more microbial diversity, they realized, and, and also to do better phylogenetic trees, including other markers, other gene markers, in particular protein coding genes, they realized that in particular in the case of bacteria, neither aquificales nor thermotogales, so these two types of organisms, were particularly placed early in bacterial trees. So the, ba the ba basal position of these two lineages was questioned. But then there is, a, again, a debate because in the case of, uh, of bacteria, we observe a kind of radiation of organisms and it's very difficult to say which comes before uh, another one. And so some, uh, some so this is an open question and some uh, people in particular in France have tried to um, uh, use another approach, and in particular the GC content of uh, ribosomal RNAs to infer the, te the, the, the temperature at which the last common universal ancestor lived and the temperature at which the last, uh, uh, last common ancestors of archaea and bacteria lived. And in the case of archaea, it's clearly a hypothermophile. In the case of bacteria, a thermophile, perhaps hypothermophile. But surprisingly, the models, and this is all based on, uh, you model the evolution of our, uh, GC content in, in these molecules, uh, point out, pointed out to an hyperthermophilic ancestor for the two uh, prokaryotic domains, but to a mesophilic ancestor uh, for the common ancestor of the two domains. And this is something difficult to explain in biology, but uh, it, why not? It might be. So uh, this, is a, this again reflects that this is an open question. And at the same time, other researchers uh, concluded just the opposite, that the last common ancestor was hypothermophilic by uh, using this time a strategy based on their reconstruction the theoretical reconstruction of uh, ancestral proteins, taking proteins, and in particular they use this uh, nucleoside dysphosphate kinases, a variety of them, and so they inferred in silico which would be the ancestral sequence uh, here, and then 
they could synthesize the protein and test the uh, optimal temperature uh, for the activity of the protein in vitro. And they observed that these temperatures were very high. And so that they concluded that most likely the last common ancestor was hypothermophilic. The question is not close. It is always open, but you know that there is a debate because uh, these people have also used uh, protein sequences and they again conclude that uh, the last common ancestor was not hypothermophilic. So the debate is, is open, but that I just wanted to mention uh, that hypothermophiles are important also from this perspective on early evolution and the nature of the last common ancestor. And I will come back on to this question a bit later. Uh, but more uh, related to the domains of archaea and bacteria. So we have explored organisms that grow and develop uh, at very high temperatures. And on the opposite side of uh, this gradient, temperature gradient, we have organisms that live at very low temperatures. They are called sicrophiles. And well, you find them in this type of environments. You can find them in Antarctica. The record of metabolic activity at very low temperature has been um, registered at the South Pole, going from something between minus 12 to minus 17. Some authors argue for minus 20 degrees. But here in this case, we are at temperatures, especially, especially when you go to these values, minus 15, minus 20 degrees, where you, you detect um, some metabolic activity, but not necessarily uh, duplication. This means that the whole life cycle is not completed. So you have residual metabolic activities, for instance, to repair DNA and prevent that mutation end up with everything, or, or for instance, to repair uh, DNA breakages. So you have still some remnant activity, but you cannot really develop at these very low temperatures. So this is something, uh, the, the lowest temperature at which an organism can complete the, uh, the, the life cycle is a bit unclear. Um, one uh, of the, uh, uh, paradoxically, one of the features of this type of very cold environments where you can have a uh, ice or water ice is uh, that uh, the water activity is very low. You don't have liquid water. And so in a sense, uh, as we will see later, many of these organisms that live in places like Antarctica um, have adaptations that <coughs> mimic or that are, are, are very much the same uh, that, uh, than those of uh, xerophilic organisms, organisms living in deserts, even if they are hot deserts, because they are facing this, uh, uh, this hydric, uh, uh, this water activity limitation. And one of these uh, um, adaptations consists in to getting, living within rocks. So this is um, a particular rock in, 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 in Antarctica and you can have communities. So you see the colors. This is a layer of photosynthetic organisms. And here you have organic matter and likely many heterotrophic uh, microbes. And then they get into the rock for two different reasons, actually. One is that they protect themselves from um, UV radiation, because in particular in the poles where you have a, a, a big ho ozone uh, hole. So you have, uh, you may have uh, problems with ultraviolet radiation, but also because within the rocks you can have water condensation, and you because perhaps you have increased salinity, etc., and then these organisms can live there. So this is one of the potential adaptations that you see in this type of environments. So these are pictures of some organisms that you can find in this type of environments, and these are eukaryotes, because. Uh, we, we saw that in the case of high temperature, we have only prokaryotes and at the very uh, upper limit, only archaea. And here you can have also, you have bacteria, archaea, but also many different types of microbial eukaryotes that can live, for instance, living on snow. When you see this, ty uh, this kind of pinky areas, these are micro eukaryotic microalgae that live uh, there on, 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 mar uh, on snow. Um, as in the case of hypothermophiles, the enzymes of these organisms that can uh, perform their activity 
at very low temperatures are uh, very interesting for industry for a variety of processes that can take place at very low temperatures. So again, I put here just a table showing that this, um, these enzymes are available commercially and that there are many. So this is something that um, uh, is interesting for, for, for industry. And then, uh, as in the case of hypothermophiles, uh, you have that uh, uh, temperature that these organisms also adapt to the uh, pot potential deleterious effects of uh, uh, low temperature. Low temperatures uh, can lead to protein inactivation or they can limit, in the case of nucleic acids, uh, the accessibility of uh, proteins uh, to uh, to the really the sequences that they need to, uh, to target. Also, uh, this is highly limiting for uh, um, nucleic acid, uh, acid dependent processes. And the other effect at the level of the membrane this time is the just the opposite as uh, in the case of uh, high temperature. Uh, low temperature can increase membrane rigidity and, uh, and so make um, membranes too, uh, too uh, uh, impermeable to a variety of, of metabolites and, and, and ions. And so the adaptations that or these organisms um, have tend to counteract these effects. So in the case of uh, the DNA, um, the, the problem is just the opposite. So you have a collection of proteins and strategies to unwind DNA because we, DNA tends to be uh, too uh, tightly pack, packed. So you have enzymes uh, uh, such as uh, um, gyrase, which actually act, uh, acts the, uh, in the opposite way to reverse gyrase. It just unwinds, creates negative supercoiling, so it tends to unwind the, the double helix just to maintain the geometry of DNA in the optimal way for different, for a variety of proteins to interact with it, no? and make replication, repair, transcription, and so on. In the case of eukaryotes, instance, is instead of this protein gyrase, which is a protein uh, that evolved in bacteria, and some archaea also have it, uh, they acquired by horizontal gene transfer, you have uh, histones uh, and uh, the activity of other topoisomerases that create a little bit this uh, same effect, uh, this unwinded the double hel helix. Uh, in the, at the level of the cytoplasm, you can have antiferrisin molecules uh, many compatible solutes, uh, so uh, many small proteins, for instance, or sugars. And then at the level of uh, protein adaptation, what we have is all kinds of adaptations that tend to increase the flexibility of proteins. Uh, so like uh, reduce hydrophobic cores, uh, less uh, uh, charged pro uh, amino acids in the surface and, and more lateral chains uh, that all tending to increase this flexibility. And we have also, and this is what is interesting actually for biotechnology, a very high uh, affinity uh, in, in the case of enzymes for the substrate. Okay, so decreased uh, uh, activation energy. And you also have uh, specific chaperones and cold shock proteins that uh, help to uh, get the proper fold uh, and, and prevent proteins to be too compact, actually, to fold properly under these conditions. And in the case of membranes, what you observe is a higher in saturation at the level of the lateral chains uh, because this increases flexibility. In many cases, you see branch lipids, which is also uh, has also the same effect, and uh, well, a variety of adapted transporters, etc. So, in summary, when you compare the uh, adaptations to high temperature and to low temperature, not surprisingly, you find you find uh, like uh, opposite or mirror properties. On one hand, you adapt uh, to uh, to have uh, to. Uh, introduce positive super uh, turns on DNA and a higher resistance to thermodegradation, unwinding on the other side, more compact proteins versus more uh, flexible proteins, lower permeability in the case of hypothermophiles and higher permeability membranes in the case of low temperature organisms. So having this 
a kind of adaptations, molecular adaptations and cellular adaptations in mind, it is also interesting uh, or it, and, uh, and also the idea uh, of a thermal adaptation during early evolution, um, we can try to relate the two of them. And actually, this is a bit of a side story, but I, I hope you find it interesting. We can um, ask whether horizontal gene transfer uh, could have played uh, a role in, uh, in the early evolution and the, in the temperature adaptation of major domains of life, in particular of bacteria and of archaea. Just a, bit, a brief uh, introductory slide to tell you about horizontal gene transfer for those of you who are not biologists. So in general, adaptation proceeds, and this is how traditionally people, evolutionary biologists study how organisms adapt in biology, it, it proceeds by mutation that introduces variation and then selection can act on the different variants that are produced by mutation. So this is the traditional way. But in recent years, let's say the last 10, 20, 30 years, there is uh, increased evidence that at least in the case of prokaryotes and possibly it's more general phenomenon, horizontal gene transfer that means the acquisition of a gene from a distant organism is a very important process in evolution that can act in a sense like mutation, but you mutate much more and you obtain something new. And so it, has, it, it can have uh, a, a very important consequences in evolution. It is very widespread in prokaryotes, as I said, bacteria and archaea. Uh, it mostly involves metabolic genes because metabolic genes um, in general first provide an immediate function and advantage uh, in terms of uh, potentially degrading a substrate or producing such and such molecule. And in these functions then, or many of the enzymes involved in, in metabolism, interact with a substrate and give a product but don't, uh, uh, don't have to interact with many, other, many more proteins at the same time. So um, it's easier for them uh, to, to, uh, to be changed during evolution without causing a uh, deleterious effect in uh, your interacting proteins, for instance. So this is in any case an observation, many metabolism genes um, have been transferred in, among prokaryotes, among bacteria, among archaea. Um, this horizontal gene transfer contributes to innovation and adaptation in many different ways because you can, uh, for instance, incorporate um, a new function from a distant <coughs> organism where the function has evolved via importing the gene coding for the particular protein. But you can also import a protein for which you have already a gene encoding a similar protein and maybe mutate this protein because it's in a double copy and then uh, this can lead also to uh, innovations by uh, getting released of uh, selective pressure in a duplicated copy. And of course a horizontal gene transfer if you pick the right gene confers an immediate selective advantage. And this is the reason, by the way, why re you retain a gene that you import. Otherwise, you lose it. But horizontal gene transfer can have uh, some potential negative effects. And this is why many horizontal gene transfers are not retained. So you can, if you import a gene, you can have a potential fitness cost uh, because um, Depending on the uh, expression context, imagine you get a gene, but of course each organism has the machinery adapted to a particular codon usage. And if you get a gene from another organism having another codon usage, uh, this uh, gene may not be adapted properly to the uh, genomic environment, to the genomic context, and to the machinery of the cell that is biased towards a particular codon, codon usage. So this can impair the expression of the newly uh, acquired gene. You could also have metabolic incompatibility if you get uh, a gene that uh, performs the opposite function of your favorite function in the cell. And of course, you will get rid of this gene. And it, it, in the case of multiprotein complexes, if you get one of these uh, genes that in, 
co encodes a protein being in a larger complex, uh, the uh, interaction between the different components can be affected, and this can be uh, this can impair the function of the multi-protein uh, complex. And there might be other deleterious effects uh, in, in, in a particular cell. So this, uh, in, in, in these cases, in, in general, there is a trade-off, and you can only retain a, a, a distant uh, horizontal gene transfer gene if uh, the function is really Advantages, advantageous. It means that uh, it, the benefit that you gain is higher than the potential limitations of the import of this gene. So I think this this seems clear. Okay. So this is a very general introduction on horizontal gene transfer. Now we know, and this is one example of this particular uh, sentence here, that long distance. By long distance, I, I mean the acquisition acquisition of a given gene from a very uh, distantly related, phylogenetically distantly related organism. Let's say uh, in an interdomain horizontal gene transfer, a gene that is traveling from bacteria to archaea, for instance, or vice versa, or between two different uh, um, phyla within bacteria. So one case, one example of this is um, <coughs> the adaptation of these bacteria, Aquifex and Thermotoga, so the two groups of uh, hypothermophilic bacteria, to high temperature. So when the genomes of uh, these two organisms, Aquifex and Thermotoga, the two, the, these two species, were sequenced by the, la by the late uh, 90s, 1990s, um, there were people discovered that there were some genes uh, that were of archaeal origin. And between these genes, for instance, reverse gyrase, which is a marker of hyperthermophily and is a protein that in, is essential for hyperthermophiles. And so uh, the idea was that these bacteria adapted secondarily to high temperature by acquiring genes from hyperthermophilic archaea. So this is uh, what, what happened. This independently of the nature of the common ancestor, which we don't know. Some people say it was a mesophile, other hyperthermophile, or a, but we, what we know is that the ancestor of archaea is a hyperthermophile and the ancestor of bacteria, possibly something between a mesophile and a thermophile, but a moderate thermophile and not a hyperthermophile. Okay, now what happens in the case of archaea? What we know for sure is that the last common ancestor, nobody discusses this, the last common ancestor of, of archaea was for sure a hyperthermophile. So here you have a, a, a color code indicating the optimal growth temperature. So red means hyperthermophile as before. And then the more you get to blue, the more mesophilic or even psychrophilic you are. And so you have that the root of the archaeal tree, uh, which is the traditional root is placed here. Other people place the root of the archaeal tree here. It's, there is a lot of discussion, but it doesn't affect our, our view on this because the two places correspond to a hyperthermophilic ancestor. And then you have many different lineages within the archaea that are hyperthermophilic today, and these are red, but many that have uh, adapted to uh, lower temperatures. And you will see here that these groups are not necessarily forming a monophyletic group. That is, they are not joined together. You have lineages of hypothermophilic archaea separating groups of mesophilic archaea. So for instance, these groups, this means that these groups adapted secondarily from a hypothermophilic ancestor to lower temperatures, to mesophily, OK? What to say about this group? Some of these are very well known. So you have um, many methanogens that live in sediments, uh, and also halophilic archaea live it in, in high soil conditions that uh, uh, form a monophyletic group, and they are very diverse. And they, you can find some uh, hypothermophilic methanogens uh, living at the base of the tree, but this grouping here, they are really mesophilic. And then you have other groups of organisms like this Tomarchiota and these groups two and three, which are uh, essentially uncultured organisms 
In the case of Tumar kilta, there are few species that are cultivated, but uh, there, are, there are many, many organisms that are living there uh, in the environment for which we don't have uh, uh, members, culture members in the lab. This is a highly diverse group that uh, consists essentially of organisms that are chemolithoautotrophs, uh, gaining energy from the anaerobic, uh, from the aerobic, sorry, uh, oxidation of ammonia uh, to nitrite and then that are autotrophic. And these groups two and three, not a single member in culture, but they are very abundant in oceans, uh, some uh, in deeper waters, but, well, so num uh, many lineages. And these uh, groups uh, are not the only mesophilic groups uh, uh, in Archaea. There are many others that we know mm, based on these environmental studies. You may have heard, for instance, about the Loki Archaeota, that belong to this group la here and that uh, are seem to be more related to eukaryotes. So now some people think that these Loki archaeota are the closest archaea uh, to the uh, ancestor or one of the potential ancestors that <coughs> uh, made a symbiosis to originate eukaryotes. But there are other groups in other places of the tree and all these groups have adapted secondarily to mesophilic conditions from hypothermophilic ancestors. Now, it happens that now we have genomes from many of these lineages, including for lineages that are environmental, because we can get their genomes from metagenomes, as we saw before. And so when you analyze the uh, phylogenetic affinity of the genes belonging to these different lineages, to including thermophilic and uh, mesophilic lineages, well, you realize that many of these genes, especially in groups of mesophiles, are uh, rela more related to bacterial genes or have a bacterial origin. And actually, there is a very nice correlation between uh, the proportions of uh, genes acquired uh, from bacteria by uh, archaea in the case of secondarily adapted groups to mesophily than in the other groups. Okay, they, ho they also have larger genomes as a consequence. And not only that, not only they have more genes imported from bacteria, but it happens that many of these groups of uh, archaea have acquired the same gene, the same gene, independently from different groups of bacteria. And this is one such, exa such an example, all that is in uh, in black here are bacteria, and then these three groups of mesophilic archaea acquire the gene from different bacterial donors. Okay, this is how you should read these three. It means three independent acquisitions of the ge same gene. So this means that this gene might be important for a function that potentially is related to mesophily. And when you count all these genes that are, so this means three independent horizontal gene transfers. And when you count all these genes coming from bacteria and that are shared between these different groups of uh, archaea that are independent adaptations to mesophily, well, you count quite a number. And these genes are essentially related to energy metabolism, membrane transport and lipid metabolism and also amino acid transport and metabolism. Some of these functions may be important for the adaptation of this archaea, which, whose ancestor was hypothermophilic to mesophily. So that's uh, uh, the hypothesis. So uh, we could, hypo well, we can really uh, hypothesize, and, and the data are compatible with that, that in the same way as we uh, think now that these uh, hypothermophilic bacteria adapted secondarily to high temperature by via the acquisition by horizontal gene transfer of genes from uh, hypothermophilic archaea, you can imagine that mesophilic archaea evolved or adapted secondarily from hypothermophilic ancestors towards mesophily or to mesophily by importing genes from bacteria and very often the same type of genes. So that's uh, something that more data should validate, but there is, uh, there is uh, quite a, a solid support for this idea. Okay, so that was for a little bit of early evolution, and now we come back to a more descriptive uh, 
part of the talk, continuing with our um, uh, with our trip uh, by all these uh, extremophilic organisms. Now we are going to halophiles. Halophiles are organisms adapted to live at very high salt, up to saturation. Uh, not surprisingly, the most or the best adapted organisms to high salt concentrations are again archaea. And then you can have very special archaea such as this uh, haloquadratum. This is the name of the genome. You can imagine why. Because we, they have really very funny shapes or very unusual for biology. So these are organisms that you find in this type of solar saltans, but also in deep sea brines, for instance. Many of these organisms form the nucleation center of crystals, salt crystals, and the red color here, as uh, here, is due to, to one pigment in the, in, the, in the cell wall of these organisms that is related to uh, a particular protein, one kind of rhodopsin, proteorhodopsin, uh, or, or, or uh, well, bacteriorhodopsin. Uh, that uh, allows these organisms to get some extra energy from light. So this makes some of these archaea making phototrophs, not photosynthetic, they cannot fix CO2. They can just gain an extra energy, they are photoheterotrophs, they gain uh, some energy from light just by uh, using this particular protein, uh, enhancing the proton gradient across the membrane. Okay, and the protein is called bacteriorhodopsin, but it was isolated first from one archaeon. But when that archaea, when archaea or halophilic archaea were thought to be bacteria, and that's what's funny about this bacteriorhodopsin, which is an archaeal uh, rhodopsin. Okay, um, so adaptations again, as uh, we have specific adaptations to uh, life in, in high salt conditions. Um, of course, the, the major risk here is, uh, is, uh, is osmotic, uh, uh, osmotic uh, <coughs> catastrophe. So what uh, these organisms do is to uh, increase, well, either to use compatible solutes, but this is something more uh, present in halotolerant than in halophilic, truly halophilic organisms. And the most halophilic organisms, namely the archaea and one particular kind of bacteria, they accumulate uh, potassium in the cytoplasm up to four molar, which is a lot. And so the, there are specific uh, uh, pumps involved in this. And then they use also sodium uh, protom antiporters to get rid of uh, sodium and include mm, protons instead in the cytoplasm. Uh, the proteins tend to be negatively charged and also the surface of the cell thanks to the presence of uh, uh, many uh, polysaccharides that are charged, exopolysaccharides. And uh, uh, so the, th the thing that the proteins are uh, enrich in, 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 in negatively charged amino acids can be even seen at the level of metagenomes when you analyze these metagenomes uh, in bulk metagenomes, so community genomes from uh, different, uh, from environments at different salinity. So let's say from almost uh, seawater, this would be 3.5, 3.8, towards uh, uh, saturation, 37%. And what you see here is the P that the PI of proteins predicted from the uh, metagenomes uh, decreases progressively with uh, an increase in temperature. So that um, uh, the PI of, uh, of proteins predicted from uh, genomes uh, of organisms living at, at saturation um, have the lowest PI. So the PI uh, would be the pH at which a particular molecule has not no net charge in this case. So you can even see that in predicted proteins from metagenomes. And as in the case of hypothermophiles that I showed you before, we also observed a decrease of uh, diversity when we uh, go towards where the, the, the most extreme limit uh, or the most extreme condition. So here, uh, if you analyze, uh, in this case, uh, diversity from metagenomes along the salinity gradient, uh, we are here at 90, uh, 19% uh, salinity, which is already quite a lot. But if you go to saturation, you see that there are less uh, 
um, uh, parts in this pie chart and that, uh, uh, that you get a reduction in diversity with uh, essentially most of the diversity belonging to this Urea Kyoto, this is uh, the group of archaea where the halophiles belong to, and then one particular kind of bacterium. So this in particular correspond to not only the Urea Kyoto or halophiles, but to a particular species that this is a square uh, archaeum. Um, and also uh, in the case of bacteria, you have a uh, very specific uh, microbe, uh, Salinibacter ruver. You can um, uh, see uh, the, the adaptation in the name, uh, which is mimicking the adaptations of uh, archaea in terms of potassium accumulation in the cytoplasm, and possibly also with a lot of horizontal gene transfer uh, between the two organisms. One funny thing is that uh, this halorchaeum quadratum, because I told you before, it takes a, uh, it gets a little bit of energy from light. Uh, th this explains so, uh, a bit uh, the shape of the cell. You see here this, uh, uh, this uh, lighter areas, this corresponds to uh, gas vacuoles. And using these gas vacuoles, the cell controls the orientation of this uh, flat surface to the sun so that the cell acts like a solar panel. So that's a funny adaptation. And of course, using I, I am talking about um, a lot about metagenomics because it, it is really a tool for discovery. And uh, the use of these metagenomic approaches have revealed the presence of new lineages that appear to be specifically associated to this type of environments. And here is the case of this particular group of organisms, the nano-aloarchaeota, which are, correspond to very tiny cells with very uh, relatively small or very small uh, genomes for, for the average of bacteria. And so you can see these uh, tiny cells compared with the cells of uh, square uh, archaea um, here in blue, okay, with co color with uh, DAPI, which is a, a stain, um, a DNA stain. Okay. You have also halophilic, uh, the, uh, well, alkalophilic organisms, so we move to pH. Why am I I'm, I'm jumping? Okay. Alkalophilic organisms, many of which are actually halophilic, like those living in, in soda lakes, huh, which are uh, saturated in salt, but also have very high pH, and many lakes in, in, in Africa have this type of feature. So you have organisms that are at the same time halophilic and alkalophilic because they adapt at high pH. But you have also other lakes that are not necessarily uh, uh, salt rich, um, like the Lake Van in Turkey, where you have this type of structures, uh, stromatolytic like structures, and which has a pH of almost 10. And uh, there are many, many lakes, uh, or like the, the Alchichica Lake. This is a lake that we have been studying for several years already which contains also uh, stromatolites. So it appears that many of these stromatolytic or microbialites, in this is the general term, are uh, frequently found in this type of alkaline lakes. So, and we have been uh, studying these organisms and uh, even discovering or organisms like this uh, Leomargarita lithophora that have particular properties uh, they can uh, produce uh, carbonate precipitates of calcium, magnesium, this is magnesium, strontium and barium, uh, which is something quite atypical. So this organism come from this lake. So many uh, stromatolytic uh, formations in this type of alkaline lakes. And you have on the opposite side of the gradient uh, uh, organisms that live at very low pH. We <coughs> call them uh, acidophiles. These are uh, very often places that are enriched in many metals uh, because the two cer the features coexist in nature, in particular in, in mines, uh, in metal mines, iron mines, or many other uh, uh, types of metals, arsenic, etc. Uh, the record of, uh, of an organism growing at, at a low pH is again uh, belongs to uh, an archaeon. Um, Picrophilus oshimae, uh, which was isolated from a, 
uh, volcanic uh, region, so it's a thermoacidophilic organism living at uh, 60 degrees more or less uh, of optimal, uh, optimal temperature and at pH 0.7 as optimum, but uh, it can grow at a negative pH, so at much higher uh, proton concentration. And many of these organisms actually um, uh, are uh, used for biolithium, for instance, because they can uh, enhance or catalyze uh, the, uh, the, the, the or, or they can remove or uh, leach uh, uh, metals from, from minerals. Uh, many of these are found in, uh, in places where you have pyrite, for, in, for instance, that is naturally oxidized to uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, this, of course, uh, decreases the pH, but you have organisms that increase uh, uh, this process by a lot. One of these organisms that is very famous because it's really uh, one of the best adapted organisms to very low pH is uh, Acidity bacillus ferroxidans. This is a bacterium that is highly flexible uh, or versatile metabolically, so it can oxidize um, iron and get energy in this way, but in under uh, aerobic conditions, it means with oxygen, but in cases where it grows anaerobically, if there is no oxygen, it can also gain energy by reducing iron-3 to iron-2 using a reduced uh, sulfur compounds. So it's an organism that can gain energy in any possible way in this type of settings. And it is not only mm, using uh, iron, but it can use uh, the whole variety of other metals. And so uh, this is one example. Uh, that is, uh, and there are many others that are related to this organism that are interesting in particular for mining operations, because you can leach these uh, metals from minerals, thanks to their activity. But in low pHs, you have also a variety of eukaryotes, and not only prokaryotes, and this is, uh, these are pictures from the uh, different uh, eukaryotic organisms, some fungi, some uh, diatoms, or these are euglena, so uh, algae, some heliozoans, and then and you have uh, here different flagellates. And all these organisms are coming from the Rio Tinto in Spain, pH around 2, 2.5 on average along the river. And th there is a wide variety of eukaryotes in this type of environment. Okay. Um, so you can uh, study these organisms using metagenomics, for instance, and this has been done, uh, and this was among the first studies that were done on metagenomics to try to reconstruct genomes from metagenomes. And so uh, in one of Pioneer's uh, study, uh, these people, Tyson and co-workers, uh, reconstructed the genomes of two different organisms, one archaeon and one bacterium, living in, uh, in uh, acid mine, in, uh, in acid mine drainage at pH around 1. And you can, from these uh, genomes, uh, reconstruct or predict the theoretical uh, metabolic abilities of the cell just by uh, cartooning the different uh, uh, proteins or, or annotating the proteins and predicting the function. So in these cases, you have organisms that uh, oxidize iron uh, in this type of environments. And this type of uh, analysis have also uh, revealed new groups of organisms that this time are surprising and were surprising uh, at the time, 2006, because uh, these Arman groups, which were specifically detected first by metagenomic sequencing, uh, were then subsequently observed by fish, fishing them with a probe, and uh, these organisms are particularly small. So you have here size, it's 200 nanometers. So these corresponded at a time at the uh, cells that were at the um, uh, smallest possible limit thought at the time for life. For life or relatively complex life, it, it means true life with a metabolism. And so these uh, have particular shapes sometimes, so the cells are relatively flexible. So these are these Arman bacteria, archaea, sorry. You can uh, uh, develop uh, uh, biotechnological application and many of these organisms 
acidophiles in particular, <coughs> but also other types of extremophiles, are being used to try to develop uh, um, microbial e electrochemical systems. So, um, in a sense, to because you can exploit the capacity of a microorganism to uh, perform particular redox reactions from a, a substrate to a product, and then. Uh, liberating electrons that can be uh, uh, passed on to an anode or organisms that can uh, take electrons from a cathode. So you can have this type of um, organisms that actually enhance or catalyze activities that are, uh, lead to electrochemical uh, systems. So on th people are working on this system to try to develop batteries or bio batteries in, in a sense. Um, I, I haven't mentioned the adaptation of uh, acidophilic organisms, but I forgot this. But uh, one thing that uh, these type of organisms do is that even if they are adapted to, to live in, in very low pH environments, these organisms keep a P an internal pH that, has, that is much higher. So one of the adaptations is to get rid of protons, okay? So uh, the most acidophilic organisms, uh, I mentioned before, Picrophilus oshimae, living at pH around zero, optimally, uh, it has an, an internal pH of around 4.5, which is quite high. And most other uh, acidophilic organisms have a quite ne neutral pH between 6 and 7. So uh, the adaptations of these organisms are largely passed by uh, this uh, maintaining an internal pH that is compatible with most biochemical reactions. Okay, so um, um, we go now to barophiles or piezophiles, organisms adapted to very high pressure. Uh, so where do you find these organisms? You find them in the, the, at the bottom of the oceans at very high pressure or even uh, below the oceans. So uh, most, actually most, uh, uh <laughs> most uh, organisms or planktonic organisms and even in the sediments uh, in oceans are barophilic are, uh, or, or barotolerant at least or piezo tolerant because they live at, mm, uh, so a large surface of the planet is covered by oceans, but the average uh, depth of the oceans is something between three and 4,000 uh, meters. So these are. Uh, th it means that the the m most organisms in these environments are really adapted to this low pressure. And then, well, the the, the deep uh, sea is also extreme for a variety of things. There's no life, but there are highly oligotrophic conditions. So this limitation in nutrients, the high pressures, and also low temperatures. So you have organisms that develop there, and that are particular ad uh, particularly adapted to that. A combination of parameters. You have also xerophiles, organisms living at, uh, in deserts uh, at very low water activity. And many of these organisms are developed in the form of biofilms that cover rocks or even within the rocks, as we, uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture just in the next slide. And so some of these biofilms are called desert varnish verni because they, they are dark like this in the, and then these organisms are essentially bacteria very, growing very, very slowly and uh, coping and highly pigmented to protect themselves from ultraviolet radiation. And actually I'm going to talk now about radiotolerant organisms because, uh, well, one of the famous organisms that are tolerate or the, the, the record is Deinococcus radiodurans that is very, or can cope with uh, uh, significant levels of uh, ionizing radiation. And actually this organism is essentially an organ a serophilic organism. So it's an organism that is a bacterium and it, uh, it, thri it thrives essentially in desert, uh, in desert areas or in, in biofilms colonizing rocks, in, in places where desiccation is important, and where you have UV radiation. So uh, Deinococcus is very well adapted. In general, these organisms are uh, to, to, uh, <coughs> to um, avoid the, the damaging effects of ultraviolet radiation. In particular, Deinococcus, in general, these organisms are pigmented. And in particular, Deinococcus has extremely 
has a, a, an extremely powerful uh, machinery of DNA repair. So even if ultraviolet radiation cuts the DNA in many pieces, and you can do experiments with ionizing radiation as well, this organism is able to uh, repair the, the genome very rapidly. Within a few hours, you can recompose the genome. And it is so because, as I said, it has a, a very powerful repair machinery, <coughs> but also because it has several copies of the genome so that you can um, you can better recompose your genome uh, or recombine uh, to repair. Okay, so that explains why it is also adapted to ionizing radiation. It's not because uh, uh, nuclear uh, plants were there at the beginning of life, but it is because it adapted to desert conditions and to ultraviolet uh, radiation. And many of these organisms are living, as in the case of, the Antar of Antarctica, within rocks, because you can uh, protect yourself better from ultraviolet radiation, and also because you can get water condensation better. And that's exactly what happens in one of the most extreme environments you can think of. From this perspective, there is uh, some allied, uh, allied rocks in, in the Atacama Desert, where you have practically no rain, and some, in some places there is no historical record for rain. And uh, so, it's, it's, but you have organisms living without, without these allied, uh, allied uh, blocks. And uh, uh, if you place uh, probes for one year or several years within these uh, different depths within these rocks, you can uh, realize that even if you, that you uh, these organisms effectively live within the rock and they live at places where they still have light because many of these organisms are cyanobacteria and they are accompanied by many heterotrophic bacteria that depend on the primary production of these organisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also in regions where you can have periods of water condensation along the year within the halide in the absence of any condensation outside. Okay, So even if you have no uh, liquid water whatsoever outside the rock, you can have at some particular events along a year between 3,000 and 5,000 events of water condensation and these organisms wait until they have these conditions to develop and, and, and carry out their, their life cycle. Another very, uh, another environment that is, uh, shows this type of combination of very extreme uh, conditions is the deep subsurface, which is maybe interesting in the case of astrobiology, but also um, here in our planet, uh, where organisms uh, live um, uh, so in this case, organisms live in the continental or oceanic crust, so at high pressure. You can find them in deep mines, in deep aquifers, in these systems, or in caves, where organisms live in the uh, fra fractures and crevices of uh, these uh, minerals, rocks, and potentially using a variety of chemolithotrophic uh, metabolisms, but perhaps not only that. Um, so, how to access these um, microorganisms? Uh, uh, one possible way, and, and there, are a consistent, there is a consistent number of studies on this area, is by drilling. So, uh, here is an example of uh, a study uh, derived from uh, the International uh, Ocean Drilling Program, which has been uh, uh, drilling uh, in many places around the world. And that shows that in different, uh, so this is a graph showing the sub subsea floor depth. Uh, in this case, is sediments, but it could be rocks. So uh, you have a decrease, of course, of uh, total microbial. In this case, um, uh, the marker used is the presence of uh, polar lipids. And there is a decrease showing that with depth, you have less and less microbes. So. Uh, there is a mixture of active microbes, but also, uh, also a decay, yeah? so we, uh, a kind of mineralization with uh, time. So we are entering the, the fossil record and the, uh, the geological record in a sense. But along this gradient, so you see this trend, you also see 
that the number of archaeal lipids increases. So suggesting, because these are intact lipids, that you have still a quite significant activity of archaea in particular, perhaps related with the fact that maybe mm, you have higher temperatures at uh, deeper areas, and then that uh, there is an activity and there is not only decay. And this you can test it in, uh, uh, in other type of environments. For instance, this is a study that we made in, in, in a deep mine, so at uh, around 700, 760 meters. Uh, so this famous cave of crystals where you have giant uh, gypsum crystals uh, in Nica in Mexico is here, much uh, or, or more at the surface, 300 meters depth. And here you ha can have access at the aquifer there is uh, at, at this uh, uh, level, more or less, 700 meters depth, because, and then you, you can avoid uh, surface contamination. And it happens that in this aquifer, you can identify the presence of archaea, and in particular of particular groups, uh, Toma archaeota, that are ammonium oxidizing and that are thermophilic. And this particular candidate division, OP3, uh, in bacteria, that are potentially that are uh, living in this aquifer at uh, an extreme uh, an extreme um, nutrient limitation so how do these organisms do this is one particular and very extreme condition low energy environments and actually there are some other studies of microorganisms living underground at more or less uh, deep uh, uh, locations in underground water and these organisms tend to be diverse, but not as uh, diverse as in surface waters, but they tend to belong to particular groups of uh, archaea and bacteria. And many of these groups are extremely small in size, to the point that uh, they pass the filters uh, that are used to retain most bacteria, which, uh, which have in diameter 0.2 microns. So these organisms are uh, really at the very, very limit of uh, what is needed uh, for a cell to survive, uh, being independent or more or less independent. And so the size here, the scale bar is just 100 nan nanometers, so you have space for a tightly compact uh, genome, uh, a few ribosomes between 40 and 50, and not much else actually. So, but these organisms seem to make a living out of it, and they seem to also harbor viruses that can uh, affect them. These are uh, um, bacteriophages uh, attacking them, and we don't know much of these organisms. So, this is uh, past year, but they exist. So, all these um, uh, deep sea uh, or and deep uh, subsurface microbiota has raised. Um, a variety of ideas and in particular the possibility that some of these organisms can really be independent or fully independent of light which is mm, and, and that they may, may perhaps depend on hydrogen produced geochemically or uh, geologically okay because you need for life to go on in this earth on this earth you need a reductive power that it is gained essentially by photosynthesis fermentation or, or co oxidation on, and and many of these processes take place uh, thanks to photosynthesis uh, which is the major uh, dominant uh, process in, in surface but it might be that some other processes lead to hydrogen that can use an, as a reductant uh, in this type of deep sea uh, or and deep uh, underground uh, systems open question so as a summary if we summarize the uh, the 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 range or the, the intervals uh, of different uh, para physical parameters or physicochemical parameters within which life uh, can exist, we can see the temperature more or less between minus 20, let's say something to my, my plus 120 pH from zero and even negative uh, pH to I put here 12 because we don't know many places on Earth at higher pH than that and so if there are no particular environments at that pH you don't have the organisms that are adapted to them but uh, 
perhaps they exist somewhere on Earth, I don't know. Salinity, you need some salt, but we don't know which is the lowest uh, uh, limit for life from that perspective, because not much interest actually. But you can live up to saturation, or you find organisms living at, uh, under saturating conditions of a variety of salts. Pressure, we mentioned this before, we have no idea about what's the minimal pressure for a complete cycle to take place, but we know that you can uh, go to very high pressures under uh, the deep soil surface, for instance, or at the bottom of the oceans. Um, but as I we, we evoked before, um, this is conditions where organisms carry out the full life cycle that they are adapted to live at these conditions and they can reproduce under these conditions. But many organisms can, can uh, uh, undergo and, and bear uh, conditions that are far more extreme than these ones just by enter dormancy, by entering dormancy or producing resistance forms that are, that are a way of dormancy. Uh, so you have here a variety of spores. So this means that you can stay for some time. It can be months, uh, years or uh, thousands of years in some cases in a dormant state and that can lead you to mortality if conditions uh, are not uh, uh, recovered, but if the conditions are right again after, let's say, uh, several hundred years, you can uh, again, uh, in a sense, resuscitate your cell and, and live again uh, or perform the, the full cycle. And actually, many of uh, the uh, natural pre or some of the two of the best uh, ways that we use in the labs to uh, conserve cells uh, cryopreservation and lyophilization do exist in nature already uh, for instance in permafrost or you can freeze uh, cells of uh, we mi microbiologists we usually have if you culture organism we, you can freeze them at minus 80 degrees or in liquid nitrogen at much lower temperatures and you can keep your cells there for many years or sperm cells whatever and to so, uh, assist rep human reproduction you use this kind of temperatures and then you recover the organisms nature does the same in the permafrost and other polar, uh, very cold areas. And you have also lyophilization. You desiccate completely your cells. And these are tubes of cells that you can buy from a culture collection. And then they can send you the tube of lyophilized cells. You just add some liquid medium and cells go, can grow again. And this is, this is exactly what, ha with ha what happens with some uh, archaea, for instance, that live within crystals under complete desiccation. You add some culture medium and this they grow again, okay? And this, of course, uh, we were mentioning these exposure experiments where you can take some of these organisms uh, and expose them to outer space and they can at least uh, endure some periods of uh, uh, radiation uh, out there. And then some of them grow after some time because they have resisted but not lived under such conditions. And of course this, and this is, will be more or less my final comment about these uh, organisms, uh, these uh, adaptations and these properties of extremophiles uh, have relevance for astrobiology in general because they, um, uh, they extend the limits within which we can hope to find life eventually in other uh, planetary bodies or, or other uh, satellites or, or whatever. So this is uh, important. We learned from uh, exploring microbial diversity on Earth that the limits to life are not necessarily restricted to uh, 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 fresh water and oceans as we know them, but also to other uh, much more extreme conditions. And there are many places where to look for I'm not sure that life exists in, the, in our solar system, but uh, when it is a possibility. Some people are thinking on Europa, for instance, and in particular, uh, this could be a possibility if there is a liquid ocean under the crust, which seems to be the case, and you have enough uh, nutrients in this uh, water space 
um, perhaps if there is some uh, hydrothermal activity, so why not? And particular interest uh, um, or analogous systems to study on Earth are permafrost and very cold environments. There is also Mars, of course, and not because uh, life exists today in the sur on the surface, it is likely not the case, but because uh, uh, which uh, because uh, life, uh, water existed certainly in the past for some time and perhaps it is not impossible to think that at some point life could have evolved in Mars. If it is the case, you could imagine that some of these organisms might, might, have, uh, hidden, might uh, have survived hidden in the subsurface if there is liquid water available and also redox um, uh, potential. I'm not sure it if it is the case, but uh, it is a possibility and so potential environments to study on Earth are the subsurface and also evaporites looking for potential biosignatures. So this uh, is, but uh, essentially you can think on perhaps exoplanets and things that are more, more distant in other uh, solar systems. And with that I, I finish, I'm ending here and I thank you for your attention, thank you. <laughs>